It's time to set aside the superficial. It's time to go deeper. It's time to engage in truth. Here's John Bornstein. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is John Bornstein. I'm a senior pastor of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church right here in Colorado Springs, and I'm thrilled that you're tuning in again today. We are continuing in our study of the radical teachings of Jesus. Now, if you've been with us throughout this journey, you know that we began the study sometime back in May, and we have been working our way through many of the teachings of Jesus that were so radical for the time, and quite frankly, even radical today because they are contrary to our sin nature. The Lord is teaching us to think differently, a new paradigm that is led by the Holy Spirit, that we start to think differently, act differently, speak differently, and that the world will see the fruit of a transformed life. So we have talked about really just these few so far of the 24 radical teachings that we want to talk about and counting. We've only been through three. So far, we have covered turning the other cheek loving our enemies, and choosing allegiance to Jesus Christ, God over money, and you can't have two masters. So it's been a wonderful study thus far. If you have missed any of these, you can go back to calvaryfountain.com. This is a ministry of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church, and there at our website, we have all of these recordings for you. You can share them with your friends and family alike, and even download sermon notes all right there at your fingertips. So to help me in this wonderful study of God's Word, as always, here in the studio, Dr. Steve Ford is with me. Dr. Ford, welcome back to Engage in Truth. Thank you, John. This is this is so great. It, it struck me as you were speaking that if Jesus went the same pace that we're going, he would have had to live to at least 50, I think, <laughs> before he could get through these various teachings. But just how wonderful that he has given them to us to know his heart Amen. and what it looks like to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And just as, as we like to quote, as John the Baptist said in John 3.30, he must increase, we must decrease. Amen. That's right. You know, I, I, just a, a little side caveat note here. Uh, when you when you talk about the pace, I, I do love that we are able to go deeper in Amen. God's Word, exploring Amen. it verse by verse, and, and really adding in some of our own life journey as we have been also convicted by what we're reading. In our studies on Sundays, we are going through the Olivet Discourse of uh, Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And of course, we're going through all of the Gospel of Matthew verse by verse. We have now been in Matthew almost two years, <laughs> just one, <laughs> one gospel. In fact, uh, as we were going through uh, Matthew 21 to 24, and we see that whole move of, of what transpired before, even with the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ, uh, him going into the temple, cleaning the temple, cleansing it, leaving the temple and declaring the place to be desolate, crossing over the Kidron Valley, over the Mount of Olives, sitting down with his disciples. For us, that has also been a study since May and yet what transpired there really after Jesus Christ came back after leaving the temple we see that sequence the chronology of of events you're talking about 48 hours worth of time after the triumphal entry but for us it took months now to go through that and only only by studying Jesus Christ can you spend months for something for him that took maybe one day. Yeah. And that's just because what he gives us is so rich in content. I mean, this, after all, is God in flesh. And every single word that he gives us, we could hang on to, unpack over and over again and find that we will read it time and time again. And it's even more rich with more depth than the first time we read it. That That's the power of the the Word of God, that it's sharper than a two-edged sword. So, Dr. Ford, as we were talking about these wonderful things of our study today, of not worrying, not being anxious, uh, that we didn't even get into our study really last week because we were talking about the sovereignty of God, that as we find that we're worrying about things, we're actually challenging the sovereignty of God. That's right. That every breath that we breathe, that our very cells are held together by him, that he has seen the end from the beginning, that our life will not be prematurely taken because he knows all things. You cannot thwart the will of God. So as we worry about anything, and that's the focus that we're going through today of Matthew chapter six, of not worrying how easy said that is than done, because it is so contrary to our flesh, to our sin nature. So, Dr. Ford, could you kick us off our study here today of Matthew chapter 6 as we begin to unpack now 
what seems so simple and yet seems so difficult to actually to to do in an obedient act as the Lord commands us, not suggests right. that we but not commands, worry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Not a suggestion. So this is Matthew six twenty five to 34. And in the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Now about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Mm. And again, I, I don't read anything in there, Dr. Ford, that says, I'm inclined here to suggest to you right. that you not worry right. about these things. Uh, but here he says, do not worry. Uh, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Really highlighting the fact, uh, and here, you know, speaking obviously to the Jewish people and saying that you're surrounded by this. He's not just calling out that it's just a Gentile problem. It's a people problem. And they were in the system of Babylon. And here to the, the people who are receiving this message, they were to be set apart. You were a chosen people. You were supposed to act differently from the world, but you just acclimated right into it. And we see those warnings even earlier on in the Old Testament, especially through the prophets, is they were told, be set apart. Don't go to Tyre. Don't buy from them. Don't go to the mall, basically, of the ancient world and and just be entertained and dining in and partaking in Babylon. But be set apart from these things. And now he's not condemning clothing. He's not condemning anything of of maybe even uh, some luxuries, as we might uh, explore those things. But rather, coming against the fact that here we're just talking about what we might consider to be necessities. And it's not just, uh, as we mentioned last week, steak and ale or taking it up a notch. Here we think with a materialistic mindset, and that's what he's addressing here. It's interesting because he phrases this in a don't do this, but instead do this. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it could be easy for me to get caught up in the don't do's. Right. When what he's really saying is if you if you seek the Heavenly Father, if you seek to build his kingdom to love and serve and honor him, all these things will be taken care of for you. That's right. Amen. And it, it, boy, this is a paradigm shift is really what this is, that if, if, if we truly believe in the sovereign authority of God, that we have to start to think a little differently there, that, that I, I think that we think with such an external perspective we fail to recognize that we're not a body with a soul. We're a soul with a body. That's right. The body is a mechanism. It is a vehicle by which we do the work of the Lord. It would be the same type of uh, thinking that as you get into a car, the car has an objective or it has a, a use. It has a purpose. You get into it to get you from point A to point B or wherever you're to go, and you have to fuel it up. You have to make sure there's air in the tires. You take care of the vehicle. Hopefully, if you take care of it, it runs a good duration of time for you. But it is a mechanism that you use to accomplish an objective. And likewise, the body we've been given is simply a vehicle for us to do the work we've been appointed to. He wants to get us to think a little more inwardly here that it creates an outward response where everything by way of the law, especially in that system at that time with the Talmud and the Mishnah, everything became an exterior orientation. It was all about the appearance of goodness, the appearance of fulfilling the law rather than an inward transformation that ultimately led to an exterior transformation. Your body would follow however the mind was thinking, however the soul was responding to truth. And so if we start to think differently as Christ was doing, taking this right to the root of the matter, 
then suddenly it became, I'm going to see a person for the person, not by the exterior. Whether they have leprosy or not, Jesus was unintimidated by someone with leprosy because they're, that would be like saying your car is rusty, therefore I can't talk to you. Right. No, that's just your car. <laughs> that's just your body. I'm going to the person, and therefore whatever the body's condition is not going to distort or take away in any way from my mission objective. And so it's a different way of thinking about things. Now, how many people did Jesus touch and he let touch him who made him ceremonially unclean? Mm -hmm. And it also reminds me of you know, when you, you're you in uh, Samuel and you see Samuel interviewing the sons of Jesse. And it's like, oh, this guy's like, he's tall and handsome. This is this is the guy. You know? and right. God, and God's like, like, no, I don't look at the outside. I look at the heart. I'm like, I'm not like men. That's you right. know, I don't look at the outside. I look at the heart. And there was, you know, David with the heart that God loves so much. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's why I think he's saying you worry so much about it, it, I've given you a mission to do and you're thinking about I have to feed this vehicle that I am temporarily in. First Corinthians 15 talks about this, that there's one body for a terrestrial use. There's another body that God has given to us to be with him forever and ever. And he likens it to, to if I recall, and, and I'm taking this from memory here, but uh, 1 Corinthians 15, wonderful chapter, by the way, but he's talking about how certain created uh, animals that God has made, they have a body for the environment that they're in, uh, like a fish in the sea or birds in the air. It's simply a vehicle for the environment God has put them in. And rather than putting our entire emphasis and focus on tending to that temporary mechanism that we possess right now, rather we need to say, okay, Lord, I just, just give me what I need to make this body function, what I need to make sure that it is clothed and stays warm. But rather than allowing it to dominate my thought and become my mission, it rather is a utility to fulfilling my mission. And so I, I often have heard that this section of scripture, he's addressing materialism as though it's the new religion in our life. And you've thought about different ways we've been materialistic. We're certainly surrounded by that in Western culture. Materialism seems to dominate our way of thinking. Uh, you know, we're, we're buying things and immediately dissatisfied with them. Uh, not long after we've we've received it, uh, you know, whether it's a new car, maybe that one lasts a couple months, maybe the new pair of shoes that we just bought. Well, maybe that one lasts a month. Uh, these things have very short shelf lives. I mean, we just don't put much to it. I, I still remember as a child uh, when my mother had uh, worked very hard and she was a hardworking single mom often. And I remember when we received our very first color picture television. Okay, I'm not that even, I'm not that old. I just turned 46 this past week, okay? But I still remember when the VCR came into our home, and then we upgraded to this 27-inch Zenith that took years to acquire, and then came the DVD player. Oh, boy, you know, that was a pretty special. My mom, I remember when she got her first microwave, and I felt like we were the richest kids on the block, right? <laughs> I mean, this was a big deal. But even with this technology, I, I mean... Everything is designed obsolescence. I mean, you buy a smartphone today and they want you to, they want to sell you the next day on the latest thing that, oh, by the way, the one you just bought didn't come with, All right? So we're, we're indoctrinated with this lack of satisfaction that we're not content with anything. And so we think that this section of scripture is really addressing that lack of contentment and that we need to learn contentment, but it's bigger than that. I mean, here he's talking about, don't worry about food. Don't worry about a tire. Why are you worried about these things? Your entire paradigm is about the external. And it's now time to think with an internal focus here. Jesus is telling us not to worry about food and clothing. And here is a society, we're thinking about how it's all about luxuries. And that's not what he's going to. We have this undue concern about material items and so it really starts to drill down very close to home here, Dr. Ford, that if we live most of our life addressing the physical needs in a physical world with a physical response, it's no wonder that our prayers lack effectiveness because everything is oriented to the exterior. I am sick, therefore, Lord, absolve my illness rather than what is your kingdom plan in this, O Lord? 
Do I suffer that you be glorified? Do I lose in this flesh that your kingdom be expanded? If we start to think differently outside of a physical realm, it will no longer be the physical that drives even our prayer life. Yes, we do have physical needs. Certainly, we get exhausted with ailments of this flesh. But it, if, it almost is a, saddens me of how we pray so superficially. Everything becomes about absolve my uh, discomfort in the moment rather than furthering your glorious objectives, O Lord. And how can I be a part of that? What is the mountain that must be moved that lives be saved? Yeah, I think you've just made a a great point and just underlined what you had said earlier in the program about expository preaching, because these these are the sort of points that are not going to be made just from a study Bible or just Mm -hmm. from a cursory review of Scripture that Jesus is, is telling us, don't worry about the things that we consider to be essentials for our survival. Don't even right. worry about those. Yeah, and of course, he's not giving an excuse to not working. Amen. Um, you know, the Apostle Paul addressed right, that in 2 that. Thessalonians, <laughs> right? They <laughs> were, they were stopping working. They right. were thinking, oh, the, the, the return of the Lord is upon us. Have I missed it? And, and of course, they were just sitting idly thinking that, as we often can do, as we hear so much about the rapture, we hear so much about the end of days, we can stop being effective just looking for our extraction. You know, we're like SEAL Team 6, but instead of focusing on the mission, we're looking for the Blackhawk that's ready to come pick us up. And I think that right now we've got a mission to do, and yeah. therefore it's not about the the physical necessities that we think our survival depends on, but rather feeding the soul within us that it be so filled up with truth that the body is responding now to that which is on the inside proper alignment to the plumb line of the holiness of God. And I think the moment we start to see that we're more spiritual than physical, then we'll view the world in an entirely new light. In fact, our prayer life will fundamentally be changed. We'll pray differently because a superficial thinking leads to superficial praying, right? That, that's the reality here. The challenges that we face in this world for perhaps a hundred years that we're given to exist on this earth in this body. And mind you, when we graduate from this body, and hopefully we're graduating with honors because we've so faithfully served and our duty assignment is a Christian soldier on the front lines for Jesus Christ, that we're graduating not because of something we have done, but because we have faithfully so served, the fruit was evidenced by this transformed life unto his glorious purposes, that if we somehow have even lived a hundred years in this body, and and thinking, mind you, back to 1 Corinthians 15, we simply graduate in a twinkling of an eye into a new and a glorious body, coming back ultimately with the Lord after the great tribulation period, as we will come back with him as he descends back to the Mount of Olives and goes in victorious into Jerusalem to reign over all of the earth. I can't wait to see that parousia. But in this, we think, okay, how long is this mission assignment in this temporary vessel to amass eternal treasures, that being the souls of men, the, the life well lived for the glorious king? If that's not our function, if you think about what we really stress about in this short period of time, that we navigate all of these things that will compare to like the grain of a of one singular grain of sand on the base of the Pacific Ocean, right? I mean, the, by comparison to the contrasting it of eternity, what we really put our emphasis of all of our time and energies and worrying into is exhausting and does not contribute to the eternal story. And that's that's going to create then a, a necessity for us to think differently in this. And we wonder why we're so ineffective for the kingdom of God when our entire paradigm is so fixated on, e- on these temporary things that are here today and gone tomorrow. I, I think about cars that I have stressed about, things that I have labored over. And I, I mentioned in a previous broadcast, Dr. Ford, here my son, bless his heart, he has now ordered an engine for a truck he has just acquired. We are back in the junkyard, not a couple weeks ago. There's a U-Poland page just in South Colorado Springs, and we're back in the junkyard, and I'm walking through this. I can't help but see that these were the dreams of every person who amassed these vehicles. At some point, they saved tirelessly. 
They made sacrifices at work, sacrificing time with family so that they could have that thing that is now sitting up on a jack stand being stripped apart for parts for other people's dreams. And that seems to be the way it is in this superficial physical reality when we have not put our eternal eyes, an eternal perspective before us, living in the light of his good glory and his good purposes. So if we are thinking about food, about water, about necessities, about materialistic thinkings, this needs to be radically transformed according to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. So we, we, some people probably thought that I've lost my marbles, that maybe I'm just overthinking all this. But the Bible is a radical book calling us to radical living, and it means that we have to be set apart from this world. Again, it may not mean that we look like John the Baptist, but we start to spend everything differently. And that's why when we talked about money, that was just one aspect yeah. of our energies it's bigger than that. Yeah. It's an entire life that is lived for the glorious King. And with all these things, the Lord is calling us to radical freedom and radical blessing. That's if we'll right. just let him bless us by following his teachings. It's just like, <laughs> you know, it's just the, it goes back to why do you call yourself a disciple if you're not doing what I'm telling you to do? Right. You know? And I'm telling you for your own good. You know? right. They were methetes. They were right. supposed to learn it. Right. Not hear it. <laughs> you know, the learners were to learn right. and then repeat it, live it out. Paul said, you know, look to me because I'm emulating right. Jesus. I'm emulating the work of our Lord. So you need something tangible to see. When you think that you don't matter how you spend your time, when your children perhaps are looking at you praying, not stressing about certain superficial materialistic things. How am I going to pay that bill? Is this not the same God who provided manna in the wilderness, provided sandals that didn't wear out, provided uh, oil that never ran right, dry right. Uh, uh, in the gifts that he has given? The, the same God who, when a, a man loses his hammer in the river, that it floats right to the surface, of Acts, I think it was. Yeah. And, and so any of these things, we see that, that God is able, that this is such a serious matter that we'll never be in a position to watch waters part see giants fall, walk through fire, tread on serpents, observe angels thrown down in battle, or spend the night with lions who have no appetite and are not just satisfied with your company if you think that your existence is dependent on you. If we think that we're really in control of these circumstances, what we need to really see here is from Colossians chapter 1 that he holds everything together, that in him we move and live and have our being. This is all about this releasing, this illusion of control into a, a different position before the holiness of God and breaking free from the superficiality of everything that shackles us to it, that we now run in the newness of life, a purpose in life, a truth that has set us free. Now, does it mean that we don't have to go and labor and pay bills? Certainly. But rather than the drudgery of a job, it becomes the opportunity of right. mission. Right. That, oh, by the way, I get paid for yeah. in doing the mission of the Lord. Yeah. Right? yeah. What, like, what a glorious return. Yeah. Like Colossians is doing as everything is unto the Lord. Yeah. yeah. Amen. All for his glory's purpose. And Dr. Ford, we're out of time. We got a lot more verses to cover in this. We're just scratching the surface. <laughs> so do <laughs> not worry. Great. Uh, this this command, not suggestion. So in this, I want to thank you for listening today to Engage in Truth. I hope you've been encouraged maybe to think a little differently, being transformed by the washing and renewing of your mind as you go into God's holy word. This is not just something to be to think poetically about or philosophically about, but these are life-changing ingredients that will fundamentally transform your entire existence on this earth as you live and breathe to the glorious purposes of God who reigns over all, who is still in authority, and yes, has designated a purpose for your life because he has seen you before time began. He saw the end from the beginning of Isaiah 46.10. So we are incredibly encouraged when you even reach out to us to let us know that you're hearing the message and you're, you're thinking about these things. You can learn more about this ministry at calvaryfountain.com. This is a ministry of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church. Services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sunday. Of course, we'd love to see you there. God bless you, my friends. Take care.